Welcome to the Vitality Coach Podcast with the Mojo Maker and host Nikki Fogden Moore, the Vitality Expert. Hi guys, I'm Nikki Fogden Moore. Welcome back to the Mojo Maker Show. As usual, I get to record in stunning locations at Barangaroo KPMG Tower in Sydney, but also with very remarkable people. This episode is with one of my favorite leaders in life, James Hunter, who's the National Managing Partner for KPMG. That is a long title, but it's also a massive job. The one thing I love about James when I first met him is his empowerment, engagement, and pure leading by example. He has an incredible history that spans defense, construction. He's responsible for mentoring, leading, driving, strategies and a whole host of things that build an incredible community with intellect and strategy at KPMG. Not only that, he's an incredible human. And I think that's the most important thing as companies are our new community. So how can you bring vision, kindness, leadership and intellect into all that you do and ensure that your steps are leading by example for others? Come and join me on this episode as we interview James about why I think accountability is the new black and how we have to instill empowerment and engagement through all levels of an organization to really build a great community at home and at work. You would have heard me do a short little intro to one of the greatest leaders that I've met, which is James Hunter. He's one of my favorites because of his tenacity, his personality and his charisma, but also the intellect. He'd never say that himself. So James, thank you and welcome to the show. Thank you. I should get you to do intros on all my things I do. That's great, Nikki. <laughs> it was I'm that very coffee. Pleased to be here. I've had so much caffeine, no, You're I'm just poked. kidding. Right. It's, it's just also, I think, iconic to come to the building in Barangaroo. Mm. And there's just so many little small intricate things around this company that are hidden but beautiful, such as the way the blinds go up, the sustainability, the ecosystem, the way you're greeted. And I know that our episode today is the fact that companies are the new community. Mm -hmm. So before I go on, I don't think I did you justice in my prelude to having you on the show. So I was wondering if you could just incite a little bit more of your background with our listeners and viewers. We have 85 countries mm -hmm. um, and I know that there will be many leaders out there and people that have been looking forward to this interview. So James, could you give us, imagine we're in an elevator, we've got to go up to the 38th floor. Okay. Could you give us your take short... So, take some time to get to the 38th floor. Yeah, America. okay, we'll go slow. <laughs> but um, what put you in the driver's seat today? Your hmm. national managing partner of KPMG, 190,000... Um, people globally. People hmm. globally. You know, that's not small. Hmm. Um, so where did you get from, you know, woe to go today? From start to finish. Well, firstly, I just say again, I'm very, very pleased to be here and I've looked at some of the things that you've done and I think they're inspirational. And I know the breadth of people who look at what you do and you're making a real difference, Nikki. Thanks, so James. well done on what you do. Um, unlike many people who are in a firm like KPMG, I have taken quite a diverse route to get here. Absolutely. One of four boys, born overseas, lived in the country, went to school in the country, and my older brother and I, David, both joined the Navy as officers straight out of school. We did that. Dad effectively couldn't really afford for all four of us to go down to Sydney and college and university and everything. So we elected to do that as something totally different. And the old analogy of see the world, make a difference and do something very different was what was behind that. I had a fantastic career navigating destroyers, frigates, patrol boat all over Australia. I played a lot of sport, so I swam for the Navy, did athletics, played rugby for the Navy and combined services. And so um, in my DNA is sort of a sport, work hard, play hard, mm -hmm. which the Navy absolutely embraced. Mm -hmm. um, at the end of that, I started an MBA, went and taught at Shaw, Shaw Sydney Church of England Grammar mm -hmm. School, one of the leading boys' schools in Australia, and was fortunate to have people there who wanted someone very different to be assistant housemaster then housemaster in charge of a lot of the rugby mm -hmm. um, a number of our wallabies which is our obviously australian team have come through like the uh, alistair baxters, baxters and phil wars mm -hmm. who are in my 14 days and got involved in everything at shaw from leadership training through to cadets surf life saving everything that you could possibly throw yourself at mm -hmm. and uh, Spent six years there, finished the MBA, and then had a number of different options. Took a different career route again into corporate. Worked at Boral, Boral mm -hmm. Energy. When it demerged and became Origin Energy, mm -hmm. 
was a part of that team and worked very closely with the leadership team as we crafted a new organisation, a new brand, a new positioning with the customers nationally and I'll see them wider. At the end of that I wanted to do something which is more regional and global and I joined a global IT company, Capgemini, looked after their supply chain, then their consulting business, their sales for Australia and Asia Pacific, and then looked after outsourcing, which expanded across most of Asia. And then joined KPMG about 12 years ago. I wanted to do something, again, a bit different, but after a lot of time in Asia, spent time here, and have run what was the um, uh, precursor to our current management consulting business, which mm -hmm. is a huge part of our firm mm -hmm. here. I've run a number of client accounts and sectors, and now as a member on the executive team, I have a few things I do. I That's look still after, very humble. You have a few things you do I indeed. have a few things I do. I am connected in with our global strategy team. Mm -hmm. I'm involved in a lot of the work across Asia, in all the corridors inbound and outbound of Asia. I look after our investments for the firm with our key executives. I look after the acquisitions that we make in the firm, and we've done 24 of those in the last five years. So there's a few things we do there. And that's defining where we're going to be in three to five years' time mm -hmm. and the type of capabilities our clients are screaming out for and wanting us to be able to invest in. And I look after a whole a range of areas called solutions, major projects, managed services, which are the new innovative type solutions that mm -hmm. we're creating for clients. So you sort of package all that up. I have a brilliant team that I work with. And I never feel that people work for you. I feel they work with you that's right, in yeah. delivering those sort of outcomes. So yeah. that's my KPMG background. I've lived in Sydney for the last 25, 30 years. And um, fantastic uh, wife, Katrina, three kids that have now left school at yeah. university and in different uh, parts of their careers and in their lives. And um, I'm involved in a number of different organizations, whether it's White Ribbon, involved in uh, Pimble Ladies College mm -hmm. as chair of the council there mm -hmm. and involved in a number of charities. So that's a little bit of where I am today, what I'm doing and a bit of a navigation to get there. I think we've gone up and down the 38th floor a, f a few okay. times with that because there it's, we go. you know, I, when, I, when I first met you and when we chat now, I, I, a lot of the leaders that I get to work with, there's a commonality in, in the upbringing mm. and the sense of even though there might be wavering self-belief at certain times, there's just this can-do, mm. must-do approach, this work ethic that is undeniable. Mm. And we will talk about that self-discipline word, that deliberate word that you use, mm. um, because we're going to do a couple of episodes together after okay. our sort of preamble. And today, I think what I would love to talk to you about for those that are listening is a massive topic for me. Which is, which is what drives me, which is companies have become the new community. You know, mm. we used to have our small communities, it'd be like a church and a school and, and you'd, you'd have your parents and your friends, and, but now people are learning how to act, do and be from work and from the leaders around them. They've become the new, mm. the new school, if you like. So in raising leaders and in raising firms and mergers and acquisitions and creating a global uh, mm -hmm. Empire, you actually have a ripple effect because every single one of those 190,000 employees has a family, a partner, mm -hmm. a mindset, an approach to their personal life. Mm -hmm. With our role driving companies and as a leader in life, how do you believe you have a responsibility to build trust and to build high performance knowing that it's not as simple as people just turning up and doing their job anymore. Mm. So this is the big topic for us as leaders is there's a huge sense of responsibility when you're a leader that has kindness, integrity and authenticity, you realize that you're meddling with someone's life. Mm. And when they come up that lift in the morning, because I, I like to stand in the lifts and go up and down and no one says anything. I'm like, hi. Mm. And they're like, oh, you know, it's, it's a project. Yeah. So we've become on autopilot. So how, as a global leader mm. with an organization that has a ripple effect throughout all our continents, mm. do you feel you have a responsibility to lead by example in this area? And how do you ensure your managers provide personal and commercial support and accountability? Mm. I think well, I counted, big... well, I counted six questions in that yeah, question. Yeah, exactly. So, there's so lots this of is it, lots of this is our to episode today: is to really unpack that yeah. and go. As an organisation, you've always been aware of your ripple effect. I mean, being in the navy and everything else. How mm. do you feel that your role as a leader at KPMG has a ripple effect mm. on the community? 
So, so many things in that. So let me just firstly talk about the word leader. Mm -hmm. right, and leadership, I think, has changed significantly since leadership that I was taught, really through practical example and, and great role models in the Navy, mm -hmm. and in three or four different careers that I've outlined before. Leadership is evolving all the time. Mm -hmm. And I think at the absolute heart of leadership is you have to be authentic. Mm -hmm. You can't read something, watch someone else and go, I'm going to be like her or him. Mm -hmm. You've got to really feel it is a style and something that is really authentic to you. Do you think you're born a leader? I think that some people are born with the traits of leadership and most don't utilize them effectively. Right. All right? Yeah. So most people definitely have the skills, but how have they been mentored, supported, and um, uh, how have those skills been enhanced mm -hmm. as they go through the journey of life? Mm -hmm. And do they have the people that are, they have enough trust with, one of the words you used, mm -hmm. that can actually um, be reflective when both good things and not so good things happen in their career and in life mm -hmm. so they learn from them. L let me talk about trust for a minute. So mm -hmm. one of the things that um, leaders have to do, there's no way I can deal with a portfolio of things I am accountable for, and I'm using that word very deliberately, mm -hmm. accountable for the outcomes across all those things, including things regionally and globally. Um, I cannot do that in a day unless I absolutely trust the people mm -hmm. I'm working with. So let me break trust down. Correct. Because most people think of trust in terms of someone who has capability or has a track record of delivering results. Mm -hmm. They're important, but for me they aren't at the core of a trusted relationship or the sort of people who you're going to be able to trust to do that really crucial project. Mm -hmm. Using a, a framework which Stephen Covey has, the two other elements are about character which is having integrity and a shared intent. Mm -hmm. I love yeah. that shared intent. It, it boomerangs it all back, doesn't it? it? It's so important. Mm -hmm. And if I can't put something which I'm asking you and I to design mm -hmm. and asking you, Nikki, to take a leadership on a mm -hmm. acquisition of a major company mm -hmm. that we're looking to do across Asia Pacific and for us to understand why it's so crucial for us to do it, the challenges we're going to face and for me to say, you can touch base with me any time through this process, but you have the capability, you've done this in the past, but getting the alignment right from the start, a shared alignment of how this is going to be so crucial, I will be involved in too much, right? So it's yep. setting that discussion up at the start. Do you start. believe that um, most uh, business founders, once they've set their corporate KPIs, they, they, they find it hard to bridge the gap so that someone has shared intent. Mm. So it's, it's your ability to get someone's resonant and relevance with that goal. That's right. Well, you, you, there's a couple of things there. There's some great books. One is Crossing the Chasm, mm -hmm. which talks about these entrepreneurs who are brilliant entrepreneurs, get the business to a certain size, and then it founders. Mm -hmm. And it's because they haven't recognized early on that if they don't put three, four, five really good people around them, that they've empowered to be successful and own the With success. With the shared intent, yep. Uh, and own the success and align it, the mm -hmm. intent very early, then they will only be able to do a certain amount That's in a right. day, in a week, in a month. Yep. And some of the very high profile, fantastic leaders have very early on identified people who are as good, if not better than mm -hmm. them, in areas that they don't have expertise in, and they get their intent early and they cross the chasm and keep the growth of the company going. And those people in turn learn from the leader that that's what they need to do. How do you loop back around and build that accountability once you've set the shared intent to monitor that together and to, yeah. you know, because I think that trust is one thing, but it, do, it happens by consistency, right? Mm. And by setting the scene and then making sure that you're managing those expectations. Mm. Well, it starts with setting a, a vision of where we're going to be. So use that example of acquiring mm -hmm. a company across Asia. Might be 2,000 people. Of us talking right at the start about why it's so important, aligning the intent and sharing my view of what great looks like. Not good, mm -hmm. what great looks like. In 12 months time, we will have completed this, we will have done the DD, done the completion, and we'll be three to six months into an integration where those people are feeling so integrated into what we're doing, but we in turn are learning so much from them mm -hmm. that it's changing how we operate. That's a true integration. Absolutely. Not they yeah. have to comply with us. Not an adoption. And I will yeah. know that this has gone well by the feedback I get from our customers, mm -hmm. the feedback I get from our people, and the feedback I'll get from them as well. 
that this has been truly transformational in how this has worked. So you set the vision and then you empower and you go, I'm not going to say to you, Nikki, how you have to do that. You've got the experience in doing mm -hmm. this. But I want you to think about this differently given the 12 different cultures of these countries that this acquisition's in and how we actually, you approach that, thinking about that vision which you can keep building on with your team as they build the sort of intent as well. Um, I want you to feel you can contact me, connect back with me at any time. In terms of governance, what do you think would be the thing that would support you best through this journey? And it's a really and I push it back to you. A right? really interesting comment, and I, I want to bring this up because I feel like the language that we use, you and I, we understand a lot of people use that language, right? The mm. difference is, is that you make yourself available for people, James, to actually come back and ask a question. Mm. So you cultivate a trust and safe environment where mm. someone can go, this feels a bit off. We're, we're getting off track a little bit and they mm. don't feel vulnerable to do that. So mm. it's very well setting the example of trust, but actually you make yourself available for that. So as a leader, you've got to complete the circle. Yeah, it, it's, it is definitely the leader's role mm -hmm. to set that up at the front, that at any point, come and talk to me. And by the way, I will think nothing of it if you haven't contacted me in the next two months or if you've contacted me five times, both are fine. Mm -hmm because you're feeling that that is something that you need to do. And I'm not judging on that. I'm not going worse. Fifth time that you've had to call me and talk to me about something, I am always available to have those discussions because we have a shared intent of the outcome we have there to we achieve. Go. Right, and that's so key. Yeah. And some people will be reluctant to go, gosh, I have to go back and talk to James about this. Let's not do that. Let's guess this. Yes, but or you don't let's want do that. this. I don't. No. But I want them, to be honest, to also feel that they're empowered to make decisions mm -hmm based on their experience. So you're not seagull managing. No, not at all. But I think this is the reason why I bring it up is because we the books say what to do, but doing it for a lot of people is another thing because they get busy, they get overwhelmed, mm. they've got a million things on their portfolio. So as a leader, you have to be deliberate mm. if that's your intent. Because you're not only talking about your staff, you're talking about looping that back for your customers. Mm. That's right. So involving clients and customers yeah. and putting them at the center of what would the decision how is it going to impact our customer, regardless of something which might be as simple as the integration of teams? Well, wait a second, that might look at, like it works really well from an HR people perspective. Uh, is that make sense from an end-to-end -end perspective for our clients? Actually, yeah, that's going to feel really clunky. That's going to feel really disconnected. That's not the right outcome. So things like that where you're trying to put some principles around it as well can be part of those discussions. The last thing I was going to say on the empowering people that aren't face to face, mm -hmm. gets a lot trickier. Very much unless so. Unless you've built that trust. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I find works really well is somewhere early on, if it's a particularly key major program, is to get people together. Face to face. Start yeah. with the dinner the night before with the key leader. Mm -hmm. And for they'd get the alignment with the key leader and to be standing shoulder to shoulder with that key leader as you're addressing the people that are going to be the leaders involved in mm -hmm. this transaction, mm -hmm. major reform, major transformation project. And we do a lot at KPMG with our clients where then I will stand with either the secretary or the CEO and talk about the vision of where we are mm -hmm. going, some of the key um, elements of, and the principles by which we're going to do this, and we make it really clear that the responsibility for task and activity completion and accountabilities are with this collective team. And that loops back to a great point that you and I were speaking about, which is mm. culture isn't an advertising slogan with three value words on it. It actually comes from the leadership and mm. the behaviors, the values, the mission, and how those are distilled. Mm. Um, someone said to me the other day, well, my team, they've got to build the culture. And I said, well, you are the culture, actually, mm. as a founder of the organization. So with KPMG, where there's many uh, leaders in different silos, but you have a collective vision around mm. how you treat people, how you treat your clients and what your remit is. How do you ensure that language and those actions are instilled in everything at every level of the yeah. organization? Like the concierge service I received today. You know, fantastic. So Ransdell met you and knew you by name. Yeah, he did. Right? Yes, and, absolutely. And it is part of, and no, I don't tell Ransdell to do that, mm. but he's outstanding. Mm -hmm. Let me just touch on that as an example before I answer the mm. question. So Ransdell is head of customer experience here. Mm -hmm. He wasn't two, three years ago. He was just one of the people on the floor. But he stood out in terms of his real passion for every client that comes onto the floor. He did the research through LinkedIn, 
what their photo was of a three or four pages, and I'm talking about 150, 200 people come onto our floor every day, memorizing them, their name, and what they do. Incredible. Knowing which room they're in, in our CRM system, knowing what coffee order they had, were, had when they were here last time. So that arrives as they arrive at the door. And knowing if they are gluten-free, their type of dietary requirements, and the type of person they are, right? Yeah. As that person arrives, the person next to Ransdale rings the partner to say, Mike has just arrived, or Jill's just mm -hmm. arrived. So the partner arrives at the same time at the meeting door. Mm -hmm. Ransdale has it um, absolutely like uh, clockwork. But at the heart of it is a passion that he mm -hmm. has for every client that comes in. So he yeah. knew who you were. He probably did more research than I did. <laughs> he? Yeah. he probably and, did. He, he was fabulous. You. And you know, we, I, my listeners and viewers know that my conversations in these episodes are very uh, organic because mm. when we touch on things, I love the fact that you're talking about talent, acquisition, development, yeah. all those beautiful things, raw potential. Um, so our episode is going to be a bit longer than normal because I want us to touch on, on you segueing into, we have so many of these moments when I do the corridor walks with my corporate clients, but what I love is leaders that earmark Mm. And you spoke about sponsoring or you spoke about recognizing talent. And you go, that yeah. particular talent, that passion, you actually bought it out and you um, developed it and you nurtured it and you found a place for him to thrive. Yeah. No, and look exactly at the value. Right. No, exactly right. Now he trains and helps yeah. mentor people in every other state. And it's incredible. You mentioned culture before. I share this is a real challenge for us. So KPMG is in Australia alone has 8,000 people. Mm. As I said, it's almost 200,000 now globally. And... 50% of our partners here are new in the last five years. That is huge. When I joined 12 years ago, we would have a new partner every month, right? Right. We are now five, six times the amount of new partners. Half of them are laterally coming in, having been CEOs or right. leaders in business coming in as a partner. And so the diversity of expertise, different cultural environments they're mm -hmm. coming from, has the ability to significantly change the culture of our firm. Absolutely, and yeah. And so what we have to be able to do is recognize our culture has to keep evolving, but making sure that it doesn't evolve in a way which is just a mismatch of all these different cultures of people that join mm. and can go down a different path very quickly. Culture can deteriorate or dilute in so many ways so quickly. Yeah. And so that requires a bit of a lead into one of your other keywords you talked about, mentoring. Mm -hmm and coaching and sponsoring. And I, th yeah. I think we should talk about that at some stage because that is so crucial. I'd like to do an so episode crucial. specifically on that because it's so mis, um, you know, misdiagnosed it's often. Understood. But what I would like, I just love this point about culture because it is like a community. It's mm. like we're a blended, uh, you walk down, I used to live in Amsterdam and there'd be all these different cultures. Mm. Who sets the rules? So when you have an organization as large and as established as KPMG, you mm. have a steering committee or a stewardship right so you are going to bring in uh, agility new focus new ideas different religions perspectives everything else mm. but who decides what the gospel is going to be around the values when a company grows mm. as fast as it's growing now and it has yeah. so many touch points so you use two different words there and they're totally different so who defines the rules and who talks mm. about the values we don't have a rule book correct you might think that's unusual we don't have a rule book we don't have copious policies, procedures that everyone has to read when they People come in. People won't believe that statement, will they? Because they'd it's, expect that you would have a big handbook like this. We, we have absolutely core of what we do, values. Mm -hmm. And so when you do induction here, you have people come in and it's almost non-scripted, repetitive. People talk about team. Mm -hmm. They talk about leading by example as a graduate. Great. Right. As a new person joining in. And we just brought in 350 bright-eyed, fully you know, enthusiastic, incredibly smart new grads from every walk of life that they've come in the university degrees. We don't just take people from finance, mm -hmm. from all these different uh, disciplines. And they come in and we talk to them about how they actually uh, are gonna make a difference and as a leader, what difference they're gonna make but working that's, with clients. And I think that's the defining word for me with everything that we talk about is leadership is not defined by title inside this organization. No. You empower leadership from every level. Mm. And that is and that's what 
some of the skills we have to give other people that are listening now, other leaders. Mm. The leadership isn't something that's given to you, it's earned. Mm. It's your actions and it means actually displaying the values you want to see. So to loop it right back into the whole community aspect, if we want people to be more supportive, more collaborative, to be better communicators, Mm. to ask for help, we have to make it safe and demonstrate that right at the top and it filters all the way through. I'll give a quick example. I love your examples, go ahead. We started seven years ago, Nikki, and I've talked to you about this before, dragon boating. Yes. All right? Yeah. We now have a group of six, seven, eight people that oversee the management of the dragon boating here because we have far too many people that want to be part of it. And I invest in three boats that we put 20 people on the boat, etc. And we have far, we have hundreds that want to be part of this. And I'll leave it with them. And they're half of them are graduates, first or second year here, mm-hmm. that run that. And all I do is sponsor it. And every now and again, they ask me to come in. Usually it's to ask for more money. Yeah. Um, but they, they run that whole thing end to end. And that's to my point of, as a graduate leader, you step into things, go, yeah. I want to be involved in that. I'd love to be involved in that committee. Mm-hmm. And at the end, they run the whole um, reward recognition session where we actually get the chairman of the Dragon Boats Australia and New South Wales to hand out paddles, personalised for each of the people, make the speeches. So you can make a difference at any level, but you've got to step into it. You've got to be very deliberate as a leader to step in. Don't wait for the title, as you Mm -hmm. said. Don't wait for someone to go, I want you to be. Mm -hmm. Be deliberate and step into that opportunity or make that opportunity. And I think to to summarize as well, where do you feel as a a partner and with the other partners that you have these discussions or do you create time where you reflect on Mm. the ripple effect that such a large organization has, Mm. how your staff go home to their significant others, Mm. Um, the fact that I don't like to compartmentalize. I say as soon as someone says, how's your day? And you say, I don't want to talk about it. You've shut that conversation down. Mm. So as where do you feel the role of a company in instilling good values starts and stops to some Mm. degree because we're not responsible for everybody, right? But we do have a level of care of duty, a duty of care, I think, to Mm. demonstrate what good looks like or what great looks like. So I've got a a simple answer on that, which is only part of the answer, but a simple answer on that is a leader should not be um, relying on structure and hierarchy Mm -hmm. on how communication comes both up and down. We are a very flat organisation by the matrix that we are. Mm-hmm. Um, and I spend some time every day that is, that is deliberately, and we'll talk about diary management, deliberately scheduled, yeah. where I'll find a floor somewhere in this building and just walk around. And I'll know two thirds, half the people, just because I've been here more than a mm-hmm. decade and I've recruited a lot of the leaders. Mm-hmm. But I will just go around and I'll sit next to them. I won't let them get away with, I'm okay. Mm-hmm because I'll know the program they're on, I'll know the challenges they've got, I'll know some of the challenges that they have at home, I'll know some of the things that they've talked to me in the past. Mm -hmm. And when people see you doing that, they recognise, particularly as our partners and directors, that's what authentic leadership is about. You can't lead through structure, Mm -hmm. through hierarchy or through forums. Mm -hmm. You've got to lead one-on-one. Now it takes time, Mm -hmm. but what better investment of 30 to 45 minutes a day Mm -hmm. in a day that is sometimes 12, 14, 15 hours Mm -hmm. to take that time with people just to show that. And it's the interactions that you have for three, four, five minutes that that person will remember for the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. They watch, others watch and they lead, but they're showing you leading by example, but then replicate it. But that's really what leadership has to be in an organization and not relying on it being someone else's responsibility or being someone with a title looks after that team. Because if you're in that trouble, in that sort of position, you're in trouble. And do you, and we spoke before about the leadership in itself by definition has changed and the behaviors mm. and the actions that we have to see. Um, and Alison Fleming, that was earlier on the show, she said, mm. what you walk past is the, is the value and the behavior you endorse, right? Yeah, exactly right. Um, so, I think once again, we have these beautiful comments and we have these lovely mantras, but what happens when you start seeing behavior that you don't actually endorse? Mm. Uh, As a leader, when do you start going, I'm off course a little bit, I'm not inspired anymore. When do you have to take accountability for your own path as well? Because Mm. it's lonely at the top. So Mm. what fires you up to keep as a steering committee and a set of managing partners where you get to re-engage, where you get to reinvigorate, Mm. keep your finger on the pulse and get your passion reignited as well? Mm. 
So one of the parts to answer that, Nikki, is I very rarely find that I have a lack of passion or lack of energy. And yep, I, I can explain you. a bit more about yep. that, but I um, uh, just find that's not so much in my DNA, mm -hmm. but the way in which I do my exercise, do my sport, do my sleep, do my diet, everything fits into a mode which actually gives me that energy mm -hmm. all the time. I just want to talk about the word passion before I answer the question as well. 90% of people plus in this business, in any organization, I feel are going through the motions of the day Absolutely. or of their task mm -hmm. or their activities. And for whatever reason, their passion is diluted, mm -hmm. is um, deflected, and they've lost it. And if you haven't found something you're really passionate about, you won't do, one, a great job, and two, it's not sustainable. Right. So you've got to be passionate about what you do. Mm -hmm. And I'm passionate about what I do here and the roles which just keep on evolving for me here, regionally and globally. Uh, it, to the part of your answer around how do you actually self-assess is you need to be able to have built the trust with those around you mm -hmm. to have the honest question and pose the question of, what is it that I can do better? Pause, let them speak. What is it that I can do better to help you? Next question, what can I do better to help our whole team? All right, three very deliberate questions, mm -hmm. but you pause after each, mm -hmm. and you'll be amazed what you get through if you've already got that trust with that person. Mm -hmm. And never just take an answer and go, I'm on to my second question go into showing you really understand and you're authentic about trying to really get to the root cause of mm -hmm. the issue or what I'm doing that has a different response to what I expected and agreeing jointly on what I will do different to make sure there's going to be a different outcome. So don't gloss over those sort of questions. Make sure you actually get into the depths of them and really understand. Why right. do you think a lot of leaders are, just to wrap up, fearful of exposing themselves in that way because uh, um, you know it's you're in a very unique environment and it's not by accident this mm. is your destiny and there's more to come but many organizations that have been built by leaders they have perhaps been burnt by their steer steering committee or by mm. their board of directors and and they're a little bit afraid mm. and i say that's the most part is you always have an opportunity to rewrite the script and it's, you're only as good as the people that surround mm. you. So if you can't find anyone in your immediate circle of trust, mm. what would your advice be to organizational leaders that are really steering large mm. turnover companies and find themselves on an island at the moment? Where would be the first port of call for them to go? Because not everyone is, mm. is lucky enough to be part of an organization that is so diverse mm. and agile. Mm. Yeah, no, it's, it's a really good question. And uh, part of the answer is going to be it depends. But I would usually start at the top. Mm -hmm. So I'm fortunate to be chairman of a board of an organization as well as in the executive on an organization. And so you get to see both lenses. Yeah. And if I ever had some real concerns here, talking to the chairman, for example, is something that I wouldn't hesitate to do. What if you're at the top? Then if you are the chair, then I would ask who are the people that you look to as your peers mm -hmm. who you can contact and talk to absolutely right yeah. and and have a sounding board you've got to have some trusted people around you and if you're in a situation where you don't have those trusted people that you can talk to you need to find some yeah. and they don't need to be in the same industry absolutely in fact it's not. often better that they're yeah. not but they're people that you've built up a trust with around that integrity part of my mm -hmm. trust component before that you know they're honest and they trust you with the confidentiality of what you're talking about you need to find those people Right, and you need to find those people in life, let alone in your career. Yeah, and a hundred percent, because you are a reflection. Work and life is the same thing mm. to some degree. So, I mean, we've touched on so many topics. I've asked you seventy million questions in one paragraph, and you've answered them so gracefully. You've got off piss so quickly. I know, isn't it just... wonderful? <laughs> um, but what? That's because I think this whole topic is just this melting pot of of human nature and of possibility mm. and potential. But we get so stuck up into ways that we've always done things, mm. and the one thing. I love about you, James, is you've, you're have you well read, mm. but you're well done in the fact that you absolutely apply everything. So I know you agree with me that companies are the new community, but you also agree that people have an individual accountability to stand up, put their hand up, mm. and when they do that, their leadership will be celebrated if the leaders 
create a safe, trustworthy space to do that. Yeah. You've mentioned that it's not just on capacity and capability, it's integrity and shared intent. Mm. So there must be that buy-in from the start and the ability to check in on that regularly, yep. um, that you must reward, ignite on board and develop your talent properly and not by accident, but deliberately. Mm. You put 45 minutes a day into going around and actually pressing the flesh, talking, mm. reigniting and connecting with all the levels of your organization. Mm. Um, pride, I think, is one thing you've missed out probably because you wear it so beautifully, but I think a sense of pride in what you do and leading by example is something that we see. Mm. And then the last comment I would say, could you give us one mantra if you think, if companies do want to look up to this perspective of being agile, integrating cultures, not having a rule book, how do you honor a values-based high performance environment mm. when it's not just profit, it's people and purpose? So the first thing that comes to mind is lots of organizations have uh, invested in expensive purpose statements, big value books. Something so on it's, the, it's when, it's when you walk typically, in. And I typically find if it's written everywhere on walls, etc., then it's not real. Mm -hmm. Because values isn't something that's a poster. Right? Um, if you find people that do not abide by those values, then that needs to be a very simple and direct discussion with that individual that doesn't need to be from the CEO, right? It can be from any person in that organization. A bit to the discussion you said with Alison, it's what you walk past is the level yeah. in which you accept. And David Morrison articulated that beautifully from uh, his leadership in Army and Defense, is that you need to be able to step into something if it's not right. Mm -hmm. um, but if that behavior continues, there's no choice but that person needs to leave. Mm -hmm. Right? And people will read so much into that that these values are real and they really matter, regardless if that person's a fantastic salesperson, also crucial for the delivery of X, Y, Z. Yeah. But if they don't live the values and are absolutely have them instilled in how they act, behave, and are, then they're not part of this firm. And that message is 10 times more powerful than articulating over and over again what the values are. And I think that summarizes completely what community is about. It's mm -hmm. how you act towards other people, it's how you communicate, it's how a group collectively um, reinforce what's important so mm -hmm. that people understand what works and what doesn't work. And we've become a bit afraid. We've become a bit afraid to interfere, to stop. Uh, you know, to help someone across the road, to tell someone who's grabbing a handbag, whereas like, I don't want to get involved, whereas mm -hmm. I'll, I'll get involved. Yeah. You know, so I think we have to start standing up as a individuals inside our community. We have to stand up for change inside mm. of the company and we have to have more leaders like you that are willing to back people, mm. not only to sponsor them, but to really stand up behind them and to nurture that type of behavior. So James, we've we've got so much to discuss. I wanna do two specific shorter episodes with you. I wanna talk about winning weeks and your deliberate nature for self-discipline that okay. gives us a high octane energy. Mm. And I also want to talk about um, summarizing coach, mentor, sponsor, and what okay. those things really mean for an organization because yeah, really it's so can. powerful. Really so thank you for sharing um, your insights amongst Pleasure. so many different elements mm. we can discuss, but, but mostly because I believe that you're creating something which is very powerful. Mm. You're creating people that go home with a sense of pride and purpose. Mm. They get to use their intellect, develop talent, mm. and you're creating a legacy. So it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank um, you. And I, we've, uh, hopefully we can have lunch and I can hear more about <laughs> some of these things. But I do want to say, if you want to check more out about James Hunter, his ethos projects, not only what they're doing inside the firm with KPMG, but also some of the very important causes and projects that he personally gets behind to create a leadership in his community and beyond. Then I'll put those links on the show notes, thevitalitycoach.com.au. I'll put a link to James's LinkedIn profile as well. And I'll also put some links to White Ribbon and some other initiatives. And I know that he'll want me to put a link in for the Dragon Boat charity, which is a fantastic mm -hmm. initiative too. So James, thank you very much. Pleasure, thank you. Um, it was a pleasure to have you. Can't wait to have the other episodes. More on the show notes and iTunes, Spotify. You can catch us on YouTube, Vitality coach tv and as always this is for leaders in life please stay healthy wealthy and wise and remember you are in the driver's seat there is nothing like today so stay tuned and we'll see you next time